Riot, Chapter 2. The twins rode in the middle seat and Brian sat in the back. His arm stretched across the crimson seat. As they approached the driveway, Mom pushed the garage door opener that was clipped to the visor. She shook her head. Stan, she said, I don't like what's going on. In the visor mirror, her eyes caught Brian's for an instant, holding him as if she needed him for support. Brian looked out his window and pretended to study the neighbor's lawn. The van pulled up in the sloped driveway. Inside the garage, Dad turned off the key. He sat there a while while the twins unbuckled. Nobody likes what's going on, Meg, he said. Nobody. Let's keep our family out of it, Mom whispered. Please. Brian, glad to escape, hopped off out of the minivan. He stepped out of the garage into the backyard and climbed into the woven hammock under the willow tree, its long, slender leaves, a canopy of flickering green. The minute he closed his eyes, Gretzky, his gray miniature schnauzer, pushed his black nose through the mesh hammock and licked Brian's arm. Come on up, Brian said, and hoisted Gretzky, 16 pounds up beside him. The garden hose swooshed as Dad pulled it across the grass toward the blue spruce saplings boring in the yard. Brian tried to relax, but he couldn't. Something beyond his understanding was brewing, both with the strikers and between his parents. It was though he were watching storm clouds from the edge of the horizon. Squinting, he glanced up through the layers. The sky was perfectly blue, almost as perfect as that girl's smile. Bri, Dad called. The hose is all tangled up. Would you please give me a hand? Sure. Brian climbed out of the hammock, set Gretzky down, and straightened the twisted hose. Then he crossed the lawn and deck to the sliding doors and stepped inside the house, his dog following. He sat down at the piano. The smell of lunch floated from the kitchen into the living room. Brian could almost taste Mom's grilled ham and cheese sandwiches. Striking only the white keys, he played a progression of slow chords, A, C, A, F, and G, with his left hand. Deep notes, almost like an electric bass guitar. He thought of going to the beach later with Kyle, and of the girl's apricot hair, and his tempo quickened. He added a right-hand melody, making up a tune as he went. The glass door from the deck slid open. Am I the only one who works around here? Dad's voice was stern. Brian stilled his hands on the keys. His stomach tightened. He hated the way he cowered at his dad's voice, almost like a puppy with his tail between his legs. Maybe with the time, as he grew older, he'd be able to hold his own. Stan, Mom called from the kitchen. It's Sunday. There really isn't much to do now. The table's already set, and I was enjoying Brian's music. From the corner of his eye, Brian watched Dad walk around the cutting block in the center of the kitchen, pause, and slip his arm around Mom's waist, which was bare between her gray aerobic shorts and crop top. Brian pretended to be invisible. Dad kissed Mom on the cheek. Stan, maybe you should start exercising, she said. Since she'd started working out, she had made it her job to get everybody in shape. It might help you feel better. Get rid of some of that tension. No time, he said, and then headed back outside. Besides, he added, through the screen door, I'm already a Greek god. He laughed and turned away. Mom smiled. You're impossible. Brian exhaled deeply. His shoulders relaxed. He looked at Gretzky, flopped his lifeless on the green couch, paused toward the ceiling. He certainly didn't have to worry about labor disputes. Go ahead, keep playing, Mom said to Brian. She wiped her hands on the kitchen towel. Don't worry about Dad. He's just tense right now. Nah, Brian answered, standing up. I don't feel like it anymore. He kneeled next to the couch and stroked Gretzky's, Gretzky's clipped coat and head, his soft, shaggy underbelly. The dog groaned contently and licked Brian's hand with his pink tongue. Intimidating his dad's voice, Brian whispered in Gretzky's ear, Don't you ever work around here? And then he rose and walked to the end of the hall where he shared a bedroom with Josh. He climbed the ladder to the top bunk, straightened the blue and green star quilt Grandma Effie had made last Christmas, and climbed down. He tossed his basketball into the closet and picked up Josh's Lego blocks from the floor. At least Dad couldn't complain about his room. Straddling the stool next to the long table at the window, he looked outside to the wooden playset that Dad had made. Josh swung slowly from rung to rung like a sloth. Alyssa was on the ground, sticking leaves and twigs into the top of the sand mound. Next to the cedar fence, where the marigolds were, fiery gold, yellow, and orange, Dad was digging up weeds and tossing them over his shoulder into, into a withered heap on the lawn. Brian hooked, Brian hooked his heels on the stool and watched his father. How could he, a 12-year-old, help? Maybe there was a way. He reached for a blue and white ceramic jar he had made a month ago at college for kids. He pulled out a pen and rolled it between his fingers. He ripped out a sheet of notebook paper and then wrote, Dear Editor, my dad is an electrician and a very hard worker. He's a union worker and should get the work to build the new paper machine. My dad doesn't want to leave town to find work. I say, no way to bag it construction. Sincerely, Brian Grant. He reread his letter and then he added his name, added after his name, sixth grader. 
after lunch with a towel draped around his neck. A hornet's cap snugged backward over his hair and a blue backpack over his shoulder, Brian rolled down his driveway on his tent speed and glided half a block to the small cedar-sided house. Kyle Kalowski stepped out in the front door and saluted. He was taller than Brian by a couple inches, with a wider shoulders and blonde tangled hair. Hi, Brian, I'm coming. Brian waved back. He'd been friends with Kyle since before he could remember. Their mothers had met at the hospital the last week in September when both boys were born. Kyle and Brian were always oldest in their class, something that Kyle hadn't hurt them on the hockey team. Kyle grabbed his green bike from the side of his garage with one hand, and with the other he pretended to throw a ball into the hoop over the garage. Thank you, thank you, he called. Skip the applause, Brian shouted. You're such a screwball. He pushed down his pedal and headed south. Kyle fo fo followed. Hey, the beach isn't this way. I know, there's something I want to do first. At the end of the block, Brian stopped at the blue mailbox. Pulled a white envelope from under his shirt and opened the door with a squeak. The letter slipped down. It was on its way to the Daily News. If the paper printed it, Dad would be surprised when he heard the... When he read through the editorials. At least he'd know his son was on his side. Ryan turned right, shifted gears, and rode side by side with Kyle. He felt strong inside, older somehow, a good feeling. A white-throated sparrow sang its melancholy song, a grasshopper cackling, a few cross across the road just missing Brian's front tire. So what's up now, Kyle asked. I'm thinking, said Brian, the sun on his face, but he kept on pedaling, following the asphalt road, which wound between sands of aspen trees, leaves beginning to turn yellow, fluttering in the breeze. The field beyond the woods, where Brian and Kyle used to catch bugs, was covered with acres of freshly laid gravel, enclosed by a ten-foot-high chain-link fence. Inside a row of canary yellow mobile homes housed hundreds of baguette workers who rode charter buses to work at the mill. In a small metal building, the camp entrance, someone moved, a guard. Dad had talked about how he couldn't stand the baguette construction guards. Hired bulldogs, he'd call them. Brian suddenly had an idea. He slowly, he slowed his bike to a stop on the far side of the street. Grab a few rocks, he said. Why? Kyle screwed up his face, not moving his hands off his handlebars. You'll see, Brian said. He reached down, pretended to scratch his ankle, picked up five stones, and handed two to Kyle. When I say now, nail the guardhouse. Wait a second, Kyle said. Now! Ryan let his stones fly one at a time. His aim was good. Ting, ting, crack. Go, he yelled, forcing his foot down on his right pedal. He glanced back. Red-faced, Kyle was pumping hard, hunched over his handlebars. In the distance, the guard flew out of the house, holding a clear four-foot riot shield in front of his wide shoulders and an angry face. He ran after them, shouting... Thank <laughs> you.